Our Bible reading is taken from um, the book of Sephaniah, from um, chapter 3, from 1 to the end. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not true near to the Lord. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leaves nothing for the morning. Her prophets are unprincipled. They are treacherous people. Her priests profane the, the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The law within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous knows no shame. I have destroyed nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. Of Jerusalem, I thought surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge will not be destroyed, nor my punishment come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nation together, the kingdom, and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Then I will purify the lips of the people that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Gush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will, remember, I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be naughty on my holy ill, but I will live within you, the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter, sing, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Daughter Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang, hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I pray the Lord will rejoice over us all with singing today. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed fe festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortune before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because the entrance of your word gives life and it gives light to the hearer. Almighty God, we pray that you will speak to us this evening. Interpret your word in our heart the way you want. 
interpret it in our heart the way you want us to understand it, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you will use this tongue of clay of mine to proclaim your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a chapter. But eventually we landed. I don't like long reads, but I decided to challenge myself today. The book of Sephaniah. Um, what will I say? From the beginning, it has been <laughs> it has been a book of of judgment. But we thank God. Towards the end, there is a glimpse of hope. So the book of Sephaniah is um, it contains the prophecy of uh, the prophet Sephaniah himself. And this book is part of the book of the 12 minor prophets. And if you were here from the beginning following the series, Graham did great judgment upon the first chapter. Pardon me, I don't know who did the second one. You again. Bravo. Wow. Wow. So Graham did the two chapter, and I'm doing the third one. So. From the beginning, um, the first chapter is all about um, the judgment of God, I will say. Um, and it's all about God warning Jerusalem and predicting the coming of God's wrath. From verse 2 to 4 in chapter 1, he says, I will utterly sweep away everything if you read through, it's like God just saying, I will destroy this, I will destroy that. And when I was reading chapter 1, chapter 2, and even chapter 3, I said to myself, I said, God, aren't you tired? At least you know what will happen. This has been happening from Exodus even till, I won't say Revelation because it's still happening now. And this reminds me of the book of uh, Noah, when God says, Noah, gather the people, warn the people that calamity is coming upon the land. Warn them, because I love them, warn them to come, join you in the boat. But the people were drinking and eating. So likewise, it's still going on today. In chapter 2, we can see God send out a warning again. Um, this time, he sent a warning to all the nations around Jerusalem. And he was telling them that they should repent of all they did to his people. They oppressed the people, even to the prophets and the priests. Imagine the prophets and the priests of the land who are supposed to warn them of the land, of their wrongdoing. Yet, they did not listen to God. Now, when I was reading it, it also reminded me of a story of a father, a prodigal father who so much loved his son. Then I said, because I, I, whenever I read something, I question God a lot. Then God has a good sense of humor. And he questioned me back and said, Basedi has a mother because your child offended you, or your child has done wrong, would you kill her? And I said, God, no, of course. He said, yes, I said it. That's how every human being is to me. Then whenever I sit, I say, God, but this sin is this, and that is that. And God said, big sin or small sin, sin is sin. And yet, he is a God of compassion. God even mentioned all these countries by name. He mentioned Judah, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Cush, and Assyria. God called them, listen to me, repent, repent of what I'm going to do to you. Yet, they did not listen. But 
God, in his infinite mercy, after he has commanded everything he needs to command upon the land, he has destroyed what he needs to destroy, yet the people did not listen. God, who knows the end from the beginning, suddenly decided to change his tune from verse 5. We notice alongside destruction of God's wrath, which he promised, God also provides a recreation power, a creation power of his love. God has a new approach to correct the wrongs that men have done. And he cre actually created man for worship. Unfortunately, we've lost this from the day of um, Adam and Eve. But God still wouldn't destroy creation because he cannot go against his word and against his name. During Noah's time, God says, I will not destroy the world with water. Therefore, in chapter 3 from verse 5, we notice a change in God's tune. And um, I will read that verse again. It says, the Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses justice. And every new day he does not fail, yet the unrighteous knows no shame. That's back the fact that God has put out a plea to the people to repent, to change. They didn't listen. But that didn't stop God's love and faithfulness. That didn't stop God from being God. Therefore, God decided to do something. I, when reading it, I see it as if God decided to do two things. Firstly, God decided to create a global awakening so that the people from all nations may turn to him and worship him. Verse 9 says that. In other words, God is still yearning for people to repent and come to him. No matter whatever you may be thinking, or maybe you thought, oh, I'm so far away from God. Imagine these people with their prophets and their priests that has profaned God's people and his word. Yet, God still says he is going to create an alternative to bring these people closer to him. And he said he's going to do this by not just loving Jerusalem, but inviting every other nation to, to him. Then, then I sat and I said, hmm. So this is how Africa people are called. Other people are called. And I said, this is what actually brought me to God as well. Because God has a plan, a plan from the onset, a plan which man do not know about, a plan to redeem man, regardless whatever man may be. And I was wondering how this would happen because notice how verse 8 ends and how verse 9 begins. He said, for my decision is to gather nation to assemble kingdom, to pour out upon them my indignation, all the heat of my anger, in the fire of my jealous wrath, all the earth shall be consumed. For then I will give the people purified lips. I was just saying, God, this changed so quick. I will give the people purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. God repent within his heart 
and said, instead of me to just keep waiting for these people to come to me, God decided to come to man in a different way. God decided to change his plan towards man. How will God pour his indignation upon the nation and consume the earth with jealousy wrath and at the same time purify nation? This is a picture of a worldwide judgment, yet worldwide turning to God. It's two conflicting things. Yet Sephaniah didn't tell us how God is going to do that. Perhaps he pictured the judgment of God has an extended series of, of catastrophes over some time that comes to a climax in the final destruction of all unbelievers. And perhaps during this extended time of judgment, God also worked among the nations of the earth to purify a people for himself through the preaching of the gospel and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has this plan in mind for man. No matter how God intended to create a global awakening and restore his people, we could see that God will not stop at nothing. Nothing can stop him to restore the whole world to himself. So he decided to change man and give them a heart and lips to call upon him. I forgot that place in the, in the Bible where it says, you will no longer have the heart of stone, but I will give you a heart of flesh. Because God knows that the heart of man is desperately wicked. No one can understand but him. But he is calling, calling us no matter what, to have a relationship with us. I sat and I was thinking, why is God calling man, for God's sake? And I answered it myself, and I said, but said it for God's sake. Man is God's creature, which God cannot do with. Man is the representative of God on earth, me and you. We are his representative. We are his, we are his child. We are, I mean, we are his children. Then, you know, I said two things. God, at first, decided to call different people. Apart from Jerusalem and, and Assyria and all these people he made mention of, he decided to call every other nation to worship him. Now, the second thing is he promised a revival of purification, which is an act of mercy. This verse is the revival and the purification of his people, Israel. I mean, this act, he decided to, to purify Israel, it, no matter what. He is going to remove the, their heart of stone and give them a heart on flesh. Then in verse 11 to 12, he says, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, exalted one, and you shall no longer be naughty in my holy mountain. For I will live in the midst of you, a people humble and lowly. They shall take refuge in the name of the Lord. This is where I actually concluded that maybe God is talking about the last days, which is the end time, when people will be separated. I mean, the bad people will be separated from the good. In other words, not only is God going to create a people for himself, 
from all the nation. But he is also going to purge and purify his people Israel. This shows the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God calling out to man. The faithfulness of God stands sure no matter what man does. Verse 5 says, the Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. This shows that God yearns for all we do. And he wants to correct all we do and, and, and give us his heart of goodness. Despite our sins and failure, he made the provision of atonement for our sin by giving his only begotten son to take our sin upon him that we may have his righteousness. Nothing we can do that will make God love us less or more. All God is asking for is to show us his love. When we were singing out, we were singing faithful one. <laughs> I call out to you, but actually it's the other way around. God is calling out to man. God is calling out to man to have relationship with them. God is calling out to man to take their burdens and turn their situations around. Man feels as if they have the wisdom, the power to do whatever they can do. But with God, all this is nothing. God is calling out to us to preach the gospel, to call upon his name, either through the way we live or the way we act. God is looking out for us to be the link between him and others who do not know him. God is looking for people who would look after the poor and the less privileged. God is looking for people who will stand for justice and truth no matter what. I can conclude by saying that the judgment and the wrath announced in chapter 1 and 2 and a bit of, verse, uh, a bit of chapter 3 is not the last word in Sephaniah's pro uh, prophecies. The last word of the promise, uh, the last word is the promise of a worldwide turning to God and a revival breaking out for all men to return back to God. So, in conclusion again, I will say that this book of Sephaniah does not only talk about the wrath of God, it talks about the love of God. It talks about, towards the end in chapter 3, it talks about the heart of God, the heartfelt of God for man to, reach, to, to come back to him, for man to listen to him, for man to be washed by the blood of his son. And that was why his son actually died for us, to restore us back to that love God is yearning for. Amen.